everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, Michael Shees, Wade Krause. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thanks, thank you. Uh, there was one third part, which is actually about pinball art, which Wade is gonna do on the very last part. But first, we're just gonna talk about the museum and what we do and why we do it. So, um, the way the museum was formed was dealing with education using pinball. I used to work for the Exploratorium. I used to go around everywhere fixing electromechanical uh, exhibits. And uh, the public was pretty brutal. So they beat the crap out of them, and, uh, and I had to fix them. Um, I, at that point, I had gotten, just gotten into pinball, and I realized, boy, people beat the crap out of these pinball machines, and they seem to survive the public abuse. So I got the idea it would probably be interesting to make science exhibits out of pinball parts. They'd be a little more hardy. So I started looking into uh, some of the theories behind museums and came up with this, uh, a bunch of nice quotes about playing and learning. When, when you play, uh, your mind opens up uh, in such a way that the information just comes in and you don't even notice it. We, started calling it stealth learning. So what was the basic concept behind developing a pinball museum that would do more than just um, uh, pinball? Basically using pinball to, uh, to educate. So one thing that is great is there, it's fun also. So <laughs> having worked at the Exploratorium, I would see a lot of patrons come through there and just bash the buttons, and they weren't really picking up any information. So um, when um, my wife Melissa and I founded the museum, we started having uh, groups come in. I love this picture of the uh, uh, this is Girls Incorporated come in, and they were just so energetic and so, uh, you know, so happy to be there and play these games. And they, you know, look at all the history. Uh, the history on the back glass, and they, you know, they ask questions. This happens a lot at the museum. And then uh, in this other picture, Melissa's teaching these kids. She developed a way of uh, getting them to like shoot the ball and then trace out the the vector shots. So it's it's not real, you know, it's not uh, atomic science or anything, but it's something that uh, the kids get to take home. So we got really popular with a lot of the schools school groups, um, and we. Decided to paint the mural. I think Chris Rummel painted the uh, Play and Learn mural, <laughs> which uh, is in the front of the museum. The other thing about uh, about our museum that's great is we encourage everybody to come in and play, and they're all on free play. So a lot of times you get the three generations. You get the grandfather, the father, and the, s and the kids. Sometimes we've gotten actually four generations of people coming in to play our games. That to me, I just I, I love that just because it's it means it's continuing. Um, we do a lot of outreach stuff. So this the uh, that other slide is at the Berkeley uh, Boys what was that the Berkeley Boys School, um, which was actually co-ed. So I don't know why they called it that, but <laughs> but anyway, I was uh, setting up games and teaching uh, kids how to set them up, how to work on them. And, and what pinball was all about. So that was kind of neat. Um, most, most towns pro have prohibited pinball, and we were probably one of the first and one of the only ones to get invited to put pinballs at City Hall, which we did. <laughs> um, we took him in there. It was kind of funny because uh, the city manager at the time, who was kind of runs the town instead of the mayor, the city manager has all the power, we got to put in eight uh, pinball machines, and I uh, <coughs> actually put in one of the clear pinball machines. I remember Chris Kuntz had to st uh, stuff these things into a really ancient elevator, and some of them we had to take apart because they were too big, and take them up to the uh, the floor where, where the uh, main entrance to the city hall was. And people were, were blown away. When we first set them up, there was a wedding happening, and they came out of their uh, city hall wedding, and they go, well, there's a pinball parlor at City Hall, and so they were overjoyed. They they dropped the you know the uh, 
going to the party and said, no, we're going to play pinball for a while <laughs> here before we go celebrate. Uh, we also took our, our little trailer, and Melissa's there in front of um, the what we call the little juju. So that was a, a Spartan Manor, 1947 Spartan Manor, that <coughs> we refitted with uh, hydraulic feet. And we would take, you know, some of you guys have probably seen this at some of the shows, we had about five to six pinball machines and a jukebox. And it was just a way to, to, you know, if you can't come to the pinball, we'll bring the pinball to you. You know, we'd uh, haul that thing up, set it up, push a button, and it would level itself, and, uh, and they'd be playing pinball. So it was, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of events with that. Um, the other big one we did was <coughs> the San Francisco Airport Museum, where they invited us to do a whole show. So we collaborated with Richard Conger, who has, if anybody uh, knows that name, but he's pretty infamous for being the pinball amasser. He's got the, the, the huge collection. Uh, mainly starting with really early machines, which um, he contributed. Uh, this this show was from Bagatelle to Twilight Zone, so we did the whole gamut of of pre-flipper and flipper pinball. Um, that was at the San Francisco International Airport uh, for six, I think, uh, more than six months. And we also, every day, I'd haul out eight pinball machines <laughs> they, they had to store, God, it was almost a quarter of a mile away <laughs> in the in the international terminal. Uh, I couldn't leave them there. I uh, had to haul them out every day and put them around this, um, one of the columns there in front of the exhibition. And they were on free play. All these people would come, you know, they were uh, waiting for their flight and they'd see free pinball and some of them had never even played, so we were there teaching them how to play. I noticed this one guy came in, and uh, he was there all day, and I finally went up to him. I said, um, man, aren't you going to miss your flight? And he goes, oh, I'm, I'm not flying. I heard he had free pinball, and so I took Bart here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I really love it when I see a parent teaching uh, their, their children how to play pinball, so I love that one shot there. And that, that's Richard Conger, his wife Valerie, and the and the Jorts, who are all were involved in um, in making that happen. That was a pretty incredible show. I really liked that one. Um, so then it got us into building exhibits. So this this the the big picture is um, called the Pin Bowl, and it was uh, one of the first exhibits I built. Um, it was I was kind of following the lead of the Exploratorium, where they combined art and science. <coughs> So this is actually a kinetic sculpture. It's got uh, neon rings that are triggered by the bumpers. I wish I had a video of it, but they're kind of hard to do on a PowerPoint. But basically, uh, three pinballs in there. And once you push the button to start it, they start bouncing around, and they just continue. And every time they hit a red bumper, the red neon ring would light up, and there was a green one and a blue one. And it's it's chaos. It's it's pretty incredible, and it, it's just it was a real eye catcher. Um, I never went to Burning Man, but I went to a lot of the staging grounds for Burning Man, and they would always go crazy for this one. At night, it was ca almost dangerous because uh, the flashes of light were so uh, intense that I was always afraid I was going to trigger an epileptic fit in somebody. Uh, the top one was a redesign of it. So I started making pin, uh, science exhibits that were made out of pinball parts and modified pinball legs, and we made the cabinets ourselves and um, did the stenciling. And I got to say, that was kind of the most fun part was doing the stencils on the cabinets because we'd come up with our own designs. It's always fun. Then these are, this is like an electromechanical music box <coughs> and this next to the pin chimes is, is one of the favorite exhibits people <laughs> kids just you know i guess they just love to push buttons so when you push a button basically it just triggers one sequence of the uh, solenoids hitting the, the toy piano and it just does a scale and it lights up the lights at the top and on the back of it, it's a score motor so you can see how the whole thing works it's very simple uh, the other one is called a bumper box, and it basically was just to show people how bumpers work. 
uh, there's two bumpers that just continuously push those balls up the hill. And then the one in the back is a slow motion bumper, so you can actually see the ring come down and hit the ball, push it away, and then it comes back up. It's just on a slow motion motor. Um, the other big thing we did was Maker Fair. <coughs> Maker Fair was, uh, I think it started in 2007. At that point, I only had one exhibit, and so I took that. Excuse me. Um, and it was it was a big hit. I, I remember Don Hiley was there with a bunch of pinball machines, so I got to meet him. And I had this one little box that all it did was uh, it was called I called it myself playing pinball machine. And people basically would come up to go, why would you want a self-playing pinball machine? And I would always say, well, sometimes, you know, I have to work. I don't have time to play pinball. So I turn this on. And then I come back later and see if I won. <laughs> so uh, that, that started us at the Maker Fair. So the Maker Fair, we started developing more exhibits. Um, and the, the two here are the, um, the Galton Board and the Pin Chime. And so the Galton board, I don't know if anybody knows who Sir Francis Galton was. He was um, Darwin's cousin, and he had similar theories and thoughts on evolution, et cetera. He came up with uh, what was called the Quinn Cooks board. It's basically a, a Quinn Cooks is just a design. Um, it is a, <laughs> what's the best way to get? It basically shows that your odds of, you know, when you're gambling, and you have to run through all those pegs, it actually, if you uh, give it enough samples, in other words, enough you fire enough balls up at the top and they trickle down, you get a ball, uh, I'm sorry, a bell curve because of the distribution. It's called a binomial theorem. So it's actually teaching math. Now, th the kids, you know, been, haven't been around the museum, I realize they just like to do stuff. So they love to pull that plunger I used to load it up with 100 balls, but that just got a little crazy with them. <laughs> you know? So I reduced it down to 50. Now, with 100 balls, it almost always would make that bell curve. With 50, you know, it's less samples, so it didn't, didn't work as well. But uh, they, they got the idea. Um, that, so I made a couple of those, and then uh, a couple of these pin chimes. The pin chime was based on something I saw at the Exploratorium, but they just didn't do it right. They used um, they didn't use bells or chimes. Uh, they used uh, used hole saws because when you hit a hole saw, um, it makes a nice ding. Um, but I thought, wow, that's crazy. You know, it's pinball. <laughs> Why aren't they using pin? And so I made it magnetic and uh, used wooden balls, and you can move these bells and chimes around and set them up so you can make a little tune or uh, just change the geometry. And this is probably the, the most played exhibit at our museum. We have it in the science room. Uh, they just, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have glass on it. It's very hands-on. And uh, yeah, they just, they, they play with that incessantly. It's pretty fun. That led up to the big one, which was the visible pinball. Um, and this is where Wade and I got involved. Um, I always wanted to do art pinball machines, but I'd never been able to pull that one off. But that's when I went, met Wade, who had just um, done a machine with another artist, and we'll talk about that later. Um, I presented the idea of making this a totally clear pinball machine. So um, that's what we'll go into. So the, a lot of people said, well, in, this is why a transparent pin. Uh, we we wanted to make a, a device that you could easily teach and people could easily see what was going on inside a pinball machine. So making it clear was kind of a no-brainer. I had seen other examples that people had, you know, hacked a, a big hole in the side of the cabinet and put some plexiglass in there and a light bulb. And I thought, well, that that's cool, but kind of unelegant, you know. <laughs> Didn't, so I thought, wow, what if he just made the whole thing clear? But I don't know how to do that. And so I, I got a hold of, of Wade and a few other people to help me build it. Um, but yeah, the reasons 
uh, one, I thought it would uh, be a really cool looking piece to make a completely clear pinball. It was reminded of the clear radios and clear phones from the 70s. Uh, and the other, the other thing was, yeah, you wouldn't have to lift up the play field anymore to show people <laughs> what was going on. Um, I chose Surf Champ because it's uh, one of the most advanced electromechanicals. Um, didn't want to do a computer one because, frankly, there's not much to see, right? The, the electromechanical one has all the relays and everything. Uh, Surf Champ's got a lot of features. And it's, it's one of my favorite games, fun to play. And, uh, I, you know, it's going into a museum, so you want to choose artwork that isn't going to offend anybody. So. Um, so it had to be a Gottlieb, <laughs> for one thing, <laughs> and uh, and Surf Champ. Just I thought that was a great, a great artwork. So uh, we put together a team of uh, Nathaniel Taylor was the first person to do the routing on the playfield, and then Wade um, did all the CAD work on that one. Uh, gave him a stripped down playfield. And then me, my brother Christian, and Dick Falkard all helped build these. So I'm going to let you talk about this. Um, okay. Um, so is this on? Okay. So I'd already been producing play fields, and that's one of the reasons why Mike asked me to do it, because he said, I want to make this clear game, but how could I make a clear play field? And I said, well, I think I could do that for you. And... Uh, so I started doing, uh, I'm not, not going to get too ahead, but basically that's how I, I got involved. Uh, we met at one of the Pentagogo shows in, in Dixon, and um, I helped him through the process and also ended up doing some cabinet stuff for you as well, I believe, for the, the next yeah. generation of the game. But So there we go. It's being cut. Yeah. So th uh, this was at Nath Nathaniel Taylor's shop. Um, he was all set up to do uh, routing. I, I don't think you were set up at that point. Not on my own yeah, machine. Yeah, on your own machine. So we had the first prototype done with Nathaniel. This is back in 2005, 2006, I think we started on this project. And um, he was an exploratorium, uh, an ex-exploratorium worker that set up his own shop. So he had this beautiful router with a vacuum thing to hold, hold it down. We did a we did a plywood version first to make sure all the uh, dimensions were correct, and then we went ahead and cut this clear one. Um, Dick Falker uh, helped with doing the cabinet CAD work. He's another exploratorium. <laughs> He's grabbing a lot of ex exploratorium people for this, and um, he is a CAD programmer also. Uh, my brother Christian, um, his shop, <laughs> I couldn't do it at my house because it was a little too messy. He had a really nice clean shop. He's a neon artist. Um, unfortunately, uh, he just passed away about a month ago. Um, I almost didn't come to the show because of that, but I, kn I know he'd want us to be here and talk about this stuff. He helped build all the exhibits that you've seen so far. We built them in his shop, and he's an incredible uh, skilled craftsman um so we yeah we met, we'd meet there and and uh assemble the cabinets um and yeah that's me uh that's the first uh, first clear one we did next to it next to a regular surf champ so the uh there's a clear p play field what way did you want to talk about this how you seen oh that? sure so i just um I just started this like I was going to make a play field, and since I'd already done the CAD work, I do the artwork around that, so I know it's going to match up just perfectly uh, after cutting the prototypes that Mike, Mike gave the thumbs up on the prototypes. So, uh, yeah, I just redrew the art, and I was really only concerned about the black line, so I didn't spend a whole lot of time doing color trapping or anything like that because I knew I was just going to screen it in black. But that changed later when we, we did do a color version. So um, I had to kind of rework it a little bit. Yeah, same same thing with the same thing with the back glass. Yeah. So we eventually did a translucent color play field and back glass. Um, 
and those were the two that we sold to the Exploratorium later. Um, but the thing was amazing because uh, Wade's just incredible. I don't know if everybody knows the, his play field work and his back glass work, and they're spot on. They always <laughs> line up everything because, uh, well, he's good, and also he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Um, so we eventually came up, um, this was your idea, you coming up with the different plastics that we used, um, because yeah. we, as we were screening, the, the artwork was being screened on the play field and it was, uh, wearing off. So Wade came up with a great idea. Um, sure. So, uh, I basically said I would just make it like a big gigantic play field plastic, which is what they're now calling top coats or whatever, hard, hard tops. So I did this a long time ago, and I printed the artwork on the underside on a really slick, um, like polycarbonate windshield type material. And the ball just slides across it like glass, and it never touches the art. And since I made uh, both pieces, everything lined up just perfect, all the slots and all the lamp holes and everything like that. So. Um, yeah. Um, and the same was done with the translucent color ones. Uh, in fact, we did those first, and then we went back and did a black and white one, I think. Or you made a mylar for the black and white one that goes on top <coughs> for for the original one. No, the original one's screened on top. We it was screened on top, yeah. but then we we switched to uh, another one that was just clear and had the mylar. Yeah, there's, that, there's that's three what's variations. Yeah. So, um, and making the cabinet, a lot of people wonder why, why didn't we just glue the thing together? I was really paranoid that, uh, I remember taking, on our first show, I took my treasured 1936 Bally bumper that it didn't, it was pretty much brand new. They got it, it was confiscated in Oakland by the Oakland cops and brought to Alameda and given to the Alameda cops. And these Alameda cops, 80 years later, sold it to me and it was perfect um, i couldn't believe what condition it was in so i, I took it to the <laughs> the first show and sure enough some little <laughs> carved their high score on the side of it oh man i was so and he put his name in there and i i was taking pictures so i got a picture of him because <laughs> uh yeah it was it was sad so i said well all right we better make this thing so we can take it apart in case somebody comes along and decides to put their initials on the side of it. So we we actually drilled and tapped, and tapping plastic's pretty hard, but uh, we managed to um, bolt the thing together so in case somebody did destroy one side of it, I could take it apart. Also, if it got dropped or something, we wouldn't have to remake the whole cabinet because it's pretty expensive, the plastic, et cetera, and cutting it. But basically, we just duplicated every wooden part on the machine and um, hand fitted everything, put it all together. Um, here's the, uh, where is it? Yeah, just uh, populated on b uh, both sides so you can see what it looks like. And I've, se I've seen, you know, unfortunately people are copying this. This is kind of a, one of our sources of bread and butter for our nonprofit we, if we can sell these things. Um, but I noticed that they're not doing the clear, they're not doing the play field, which is the hardest part. They're making the cabinet clear, but they're using the original play field. That's cheating. Wade did all the plastics on that, um, using the same process. And um, they're all silk screen too, like the original, which I think is, is great. Um, and then the finished piece started going around and making the circuits. Uh, this this was at the Bedford Art Gallery, and these kids, you know, there's all this art around. Of course, it, uh, the art patrons bring their their kids, like try and get them to appreciate art. They all made a beeline for the <laughs> pinball machine, and this I love this little girl is pl is playing it while all the all the guys are watching. It's pretty funny. Uh, Jim Shelberg put us on the cover of Pin Game Journal. Is he, is he still here? Nope. I saw it. Yeah, he stepped out. Um, which we we were real excited about that. He did that. He did the whole story about how we um, how we built it. 
um, we took it to the Aztec, uh, the Association of Science and Technology Centers uh, down in LA, and Bill Nye showed up and was playing it. <laughs> that was, that really uh, felt good seeing him playing that. <laughs> he really got into it too. Um, what, I don't know if anybody's heard of Steve Fury, but Steve Fury has done these incredible animations of Gottlieb reset. Uh, they're computer animations uh, demonstrating how, the, how they s the sequence works and the switches involved. And uh, I asked him, I said, wow, this would be great because it's a Gottlieb four player. He's showing the whole reset sequence. I, I, could, could I have a copy of that in high res? Because the one on the, on the um, internet wasn't, wasn't very high res. And he said, yeah, I have the high res. And yeah, you know, you're nonprofit. So he, he gave me the file. And I built another little clear <laughs> kiosk for it to go next to the clear uh, pin. And it's great because you can see exactly, you know, if you don't understand it when you're pushing the button, you can watch this video and it's really clear. Um, we eventually made three different versions of the clear pin. We made the, um, this is a translucent um, surf champ. And then um, I wanted to make a couple that had to do with the first, the transition from electromechanical to computers. Because uh, I was, and I was looking for a machine that would, th that they, they did that with. Um, the, the one in the back, the, um, that's a Hollywood? Or what is that? Um, it's, the, it's the first one Bally used to, to go electronic. It was an electromechanical pinball machine called, um, no, Freedom was the first production <laughs> one, but the prototype, Flickr, thank you. Yeah, it was a Hollywood theme um, motion picture pinball. So that, that was the prototype that uh, um, they developed the board set and Bally adopted that. But the first game they made was they took a Bally Freedom and made that the first electronic or uh, computer controlled pinball machine. Uh, the first elect solid state machine was uh, Spirit of 76 by Mirko, but this was the first production. I mean, uh, I'd like to say Mirko, but Mirko wasn't a computer game. It was actually all done with so uh, uh, logic chips. So when you turn that thing on, it was ready to go. The the Bally one, it had to boot up. So we put, we had an electromechanical one next to the electronic one just for comparison. And it's a pretty powerful ex exhibit because you really get to see the play field. The play is exactly the same. The artwork's pretty much the same on both of those machines. But the guts, it's just its just jaw dropping when you when you look at it and you go, oh, those, those boards in the head replaced all this stuff in the, uh, the mechanical board and all the stuff in the head. Um, so it was, it was pretty powerful. Um, we also did, um, we do a lot of outreach stuff. And this one was our furthest outreach. We went to Germany and my wife, Melissa and I took over 25 machines uh, and I think a dozen exhibits and 10 of, the, of, of our murals that the artists paint. And it went to the Faino in Wolfsburg. Uh, and it was there for six, months, actually I think it was a little more than six months they hung on to it for a bit. And it was for their fifth year anniversary. Uh, the mentor for the museum uh, did a lot of work with the Exploratorium. A lot of the exhibits in that particular museum came from the Exploratorium. And uh, he happened to be a pinball fanatic. Um, and for the fifth uh, anniversary, he wanted pinball. So he called us up and said, what can you do? So we, we did that along with uh, four other artists that made uh, pinball stuff. But we were the main ones with the, uh, with the <coughs> we brought all three versions of the clear pinball machines. And the Germans went pretty crazy for that. So um, at this point, we're going to talk about pinball art. Um, I'm going to let Wade take over. All right. 
Hello, uh, I'm Wade Kraus, and most of you probably know me for doing reproduction play fields and back glasses. Um, so I'm just going to say that, you know, I, I was always drawn to pinball art as a kid, and I grew up playing games in the 70s and uh, got involved at a pretty young age making back glasses. Uh, Go ahead and click the. Um, it was in my early 20s when I decided I wanted to do this. Uh, I had learned silk screening on my own. Uh, my grandmother was an artist and she gave me a bunch of silk screening supplies that she used to use and kind of figured out how to do it. And I would, had already been collecting pinball machines and I realized that bad glasses were like hard to come by. So. I became part of uh, this reproduction group of people called the Dirty Dozen, which goes way back. It was started by this guy, Herb Silvers, out of Los Angeles, and he was sort of local to me. And uh, I had done a glass, and I told him I wanted to do glasses with him because he was already making reproduction glasses, and he was all for it. So I did that for, I don't know, quite a while. Um, most these ones were done by somebody else. These are hanging in my office. These are some that I kept over the years. The most of the ones I did are, are long gone, but they were all like you know wood rails or early '60s games for him. They were all licensed by Gottlieb. Yeah, like uh, yeah. So, anyways, uh, here's part of the process. Um, I'm again. I'm mostly a printer. Uh, so I'm doing some color separations there on a poster. That was my, what I used to do, a lot of posters and T-shirts and stuff like this. And you see the old school uh, red thing right there? That's that's the way film used to be done. I did all my back glass work with that. That's a, like a gelatin on two layers. The red layer will peel off of a clear layer. You cut away the stuff that you don't want and you peel it away. So that poster is going to be a solid color with a little white window in the middle, and then the black will go on top of it. And I'm using the black line as a, a cutting guide. All my back glasses were done that way, all hand cut. And to the right is a, a typical t-shirt press, but I'm printing a little art toy. This was a project I got involved with in the early 2000s. And... Uh, they were the carnival knockdown dolls that have the fur around them, but we made them with different artists, and over a, over 100 artists got involved in that project. And so right there, I'm working with a guy named K.R.K. Ryden. I'm doing his poster for his art show, and then I'm also printing his circus punks. So this is how I ended up meeting uh, Dirty Donnie. He was involved in the circus punks process, and... Uh, he was one of the few people that he was one of the guys early on that did this and he called and he was he knew that I was into pinball and he was really into it also and he started name dropping pinball artists and uh so anyways the our circus punk thing went well and he said hey you know I, I really want to do a game and I had already been making back glasses I had already made play fields I had already made plastics uh, so I said, yeah, sure, let's do, let's start with just doing a glass. So that was, uh, this is, this is kind of a different part, but anyways, first of all, we just did a glass and we started with that just to see like how it would go. And, um, this was an album cover he did. This is a band called the Helicopters. And this was an album cover that he did, and he thought it would make a really great transition to a back glass, and I thought he was totally right. I used fluorescent pigments that cannot be done with an inkjet process. This is all silk screened by hand by me. And um, so anyways, we did enough glasses to sell some, and that kind of sort of self-funded the project. So here I am doing a, a stencil test for the cabinet, and the cabinet was super beat up. And then around there are cabinets that I built from scratch for another art project that I'll get to later. So uh, that's the way the glass illuminates right there. He left that stuff up to me. He always, I've, I've done 
at least four back glasses for him that are here. And I, he always leaves the lighting part up to me. And that's my favorite part. And that's something you don't get anymore on modern games. They're just lit up by one big thing. They don't have baffle boards to isolate the bulbs. All the stars twinkle in this thing. I really like the flashing bulbs. And then there's the cabinet painted after, you know, doing the stencil tests. And then I just built the game. Let me go ahead and... And uh, so I thought, you know, this is so cool. And it's and Donnie's not known in the pinball world at this point, but he's known in like the hot rod circuit. He's known in rock and roll and stuff like that. So what we did was um, we would take this game, besides pinball shows, we would take it to other events. And um, he was like at some kind of trade show for clothing he took the game there, and then one of the, go ahead and advance it. Um, this ended, it ended up at a film festival out in Texas. They they uh, shipped the game out there, and this is where I'm at right now. There's a, a movie about me, um, Wade Krause, pinball artist. You can look it up on it's online. Uh, they were showing it at this event, so they wanted to bring the the game out. And then one of the things we took it to was a car show. And uh, Donnie's really known in the hot rod world, so that eventually led to, go ahead and do the next screen, uh, at the car show, James Hetfield from Metallica was there, and he already knew Donnie, Donnie had done work for the band, and he saw the helicopters and started asking me about it, and I said, yeah, we could, we could do one for you, and he was all for it, so um, I'll pull up the, this back glass so you can see that. This is the Metallica game you want. <laughs> and if you look at it, uh, how it lights up, all the clouds light up uh, separate from the lettering. The, the amplifiers eventually turn red when you get to like the shaker motor mode. It like sounds like the crowd, <coughs> the crowd is roaring. And uh, their eyeballs and the, the letter M's and the flames coming off the amplifiers are all screened in metallic ink. Again, something you can't really do with an inkjet process. This is, again, all hand silk, hand silk screened with the proper masking layer, the way they used to do them. Hmm. So. You want to mention Dan? That. Yeah, this is my friend Dan. That's Dan Kramer, who used to work at Atari, and he's local to me. He helped uh, do the build on this game. He's a longtime pinball collector. He's been out to Expo a number of times, and um, he, he's helped us at the museum um, fix that French game. Yeah, he worked on the rally. Uh, the rally game. The rally <laughs> game. <laughs> nobody can fix that, but uh, Dan. Dan. T so go ahead and go forward. This is the back glass during the process. And then Donnie came up with this um, play field, which is just stunning in person. It's all done, again, he's all into hot rods. And just like the helicopters, he started with a metal flake surface. You know, it's, you bury, you shoot all this glitter stuff on there and you bury it in clear coat and you gotta level it out and then you start painting on top of that. And it just really sparkles when you see it, it's so pretty. And then he's a expert pen striper so he does a bunch of that kind of stuff on the game same with the helicopters and uh, go ahead and here's the crew this is how i met tanya kleiss um, right over there <laughs> tanya big programmer over at stern if you don't know him awesome guy uh it just it was just so coincidental i i called mike he, Mike knew a guy, I'd seen a, someone do tweaking on a, an earth shaker and they happened to work at the Exploratorium. And Mike goes, well, that guy doesn't do that anymore. He's not gonna help you. And uh, I'm saying, ugh, that's kind of why I got an earth shaker. But, but I know somebody who else who might do it, this guy who comes to the museum, he just loves pinball and he's a programmer. And so I called Tanya and right from the beginning he was in. So uh, here we are. 
uh, I brought brought the game back up to Alameda, and then we're then here it is finished. This is the the crew. This Tanya my and myself. Dirty Donnie's kneeling down, and that's James Hetfield when we gave the game to James, and he was just thrilled with it. Uh, it was at their studio. They were actually having a rehearsal that day. So just to interject, the um, person at the Exploratorium who had programmed a an Earthshaker, um, it's now in our warehouse. It it actually was here at the um, Expo one year. It's called Go Girl. Go Girl was this uh, a re rethemed, reprogrammed Earthshaker, just like Wade and Dirty Donnie did. Uh, that was uh, you stepped into these high heels to play it, and and you played it and earn your makeup and yeah, earn and your, your makeup, wigs. and then uh, it would take a picture of you. You could put a wig on, <laughs> try on different wigs. It's pretty. It's pretty neat. So. All right. So uh, James Hetfield was so excited about that game that it wasn't long before he said he wanted another one. Yeah, and and uh, so again, a bunch of fluorescent colors. This game has never been seen. Uh, well, I take that back. He he, lo he loaned it to Donnie for an art show that happened in Santa Monica. I was there. Again, lights up. Really, really cool. And in that area where the, the woman is by the fire, that's all done with twinkle bulbs and all the sky. You can see how many stars there are. That's all isolated from the lettering. So this crazy back panel that I made, which you'll see in a minute. It's all pocketed out to uh, isolate the bulbs. And that's Donnie. Uh, that's our friend Greg Ong. He did some machining on it. He made some custom pis pistons. This was an Elvira and the Party Monsters. And so instead of boogeyman, we put pistons in there firing out of an engine. And Greg made those on a lathe. They looked really great. And uh, so that's myself and Donnie and Tanyo again, the same team of people. So there's a yeah, that's how it lights up. This is just a mock-up in the computer. It's really it's a lot brighter in the yeah you when, know, when it's when it's doing it in person. When I saw it, I couldn't believe it. Uh, the bonfire that we have a detail of I had twinkle lights behind it, so it really looked like this bonfire happening. It was a, that's a, it's probably a, the coolest it's a effect I've ever so seen. It, it just random, you know, it doesn't go completely black, but yeah. That was, it was pretty amazing. So anyways, um, again, the idea was to get these games in into areas that are not normally, you know, not just pinball venues. And uh, so this was shown at an art gallery. And uh, this, this is some close-up details of that game. Yeah, it's totally custom. It's a whole game. And again, Tanya did a lot of sound effects and uh, voice writing and stuff like that, which, oh, I should also mention that James Hetfield did a lot of voiceovers for these games, which was really awesome. Didn't expect that. So before, before I even got that far into the whole thing, I did another art game. Uh, because of the helicopters, I got in, asked to do get involved through this gallery with a San Francisco artist named William Wiley, William T. Wiley. And he, he's kind of an old, older guy, and uh, I didn't know anything about him, really. And the, the, the weird thing was, like, they never let me talk directly to him. Like, I had to do all the communication through this gallery, like he was some kind of guarded, shielded dude. And they didn't always relay the information correctly because the first thing he submitted was a watercolor painting and pencils and I go well I go okay uh, so then I did a back glass print of that watercolor painting which was almost spot on and then when they saw it they go uh, it, you did a great job but it doesn't look like pinball art I'm like of course it doesn't look like pinball art 
<laughs> I told you to think of a coloring book, not a watercolor. Yeah. So anyways, they had to kind of backpedal and then tell him to redo everything. And then all of a sudden this was cutting into a deadline because now he's reworking his stuff. So anyways, on this project, I printed the back glass, the play fields, the plastics. I built the cabinets from scratch. Those were those cabinets you saw earlier. They were painted by somebody else. Um, I, his name slips my mind. I actually never met him. And uh, this, this is Jim Dietrich who did the building on it. I didn't have time to even think about that. This, this came out, we made one machine, but I made enough parts for 10 machines. And the, the, the idea was going to be done as a limited edition. So they took the first one and it sold to the San Jose Museum of Art for a lot of money. And then they used that as a way to upsell the next one. And, uh, and then they used that to upsell the next three. You know, I was there. Uh, I went with Jim Dietrich to the San Jose uh, Art Museum, and uh, we set it up, and um, they have a um, curator team come in, you know, like uh, three or four very wealthy people. They come in and look at all the art, because this wasn't the only art being presented. And at the end of that, um, we actually had left at that point, packed it up, and we're driving home, and he got the call that that was the only art piece that they picked out was to buy was what is that pinball machine wow yeah oh, i didn't know that so yeah. anyways it turns out that uh this game did travel it ended up at the whitney museum and it also ended up at the smithsonian yeah. and that is the first pinball machine to ever be in the smithsonian yeah thank you <laughs> it's because of him not because of me so <laughs> he's kind of famous just saying um, so this led to some other customs that I did with a guy named David Bach out of Pittsburgh. He had a thing called Tilt Warning, and David ran the, the Papa warehouse for years, um, did the tournaments and all that stuff, but uh, he's, he's not doing it anymore. He's living in L.A., and this is one of the last things I did with him. I did a, another game called Evil Mansion of Mind Expansion with an artist named Soviet, and this one was uh, did Fail and another artist named Bast for a a pop-up art show that happened in Miami. And the entire show was all custom machines, but I only worked on the pinball end of it. So uh, Dave did the building, I did all the printing. Playfields were hand-painted by the artists. And then uh, they toured the show into different cities around the world. And then like they, they gutted everything and redid it again as a new show. So like all this stuff doesn't even exist anymore. And uh, I spent a lot of money just to just to have a pop-up event where you just come and play for games for free. But uh, they're they're very well known. And it's the thing was called the Deluxe Flux. You can look that up, and it's it's now a location in New York, and all the, the stuff in there is all of their work and their their custom pieces. So that's kind of the end of it. Um, there's a happy way. There's a, there's a happy way. I'm like, <laughs> I'm in my in my zone right there in my shop, and uh, <laughs> that was a long time ago. It was <laughs> You're still happy. Uh, <laughs> usually. Okay. okay, so thank you so much. Yeah. So I think we were going to take questions, but we, we got our time cut a little short, so we were going to give that up to the – can we do some – yeah, if, you, if anybody that has possible? questions, that's fine. Anybody have questions? Yeah. Building exhibits, you know, building exhibits of the Exploratorium. I, I, and, and the other thing was I, I, I try to avoid it math as much as possible. So I said, uh, you know, what do they use, three-quarters? Uh, that's what I'm going to use, three quarters. <laughs> I, you know, the thing weighs about 400 pounds. It's it's a whopper. So um, a lot of people said, why don't you make it out of, you know, half inch or <laughs> less? 
And, you know, the reason was I'd have to change everything, you know, and, and the play field had to be that, um, you know. And they're, you know, they, they've held up really well. Yeah. Currently, I am kind of on a, a hiatus right now, um, doing a lot of stuff with my family, and I'm trying to kind of fix. I had a batch of play fields that went bad because of the wood, uh, and so I'm kind of slowly chipping away at fixing those and getting them sent out. Uh, but coming up next is going to be countdown, most likely. I had a guy from Canada uh, supply some art and inserts and everything in the cutting file. I ran a test and printed out film, and it looks like it's going to work. Uh, it's my first time actually collaborating with somebody on a play field. So uh, if it all goes well, he wants to keep giving me files and then have me do the production. But uh, I'm kind of looking for a different wood source right now. So might have found one today. Oh, that's good. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>